Okay, ladies and gents, uh, welcome back. And uh, we've got uh, now, uh, looking forward to this. Um, uh, this is, as we've got here, the Sounds of Love, Peyton Kite, all the way from Cornwall. Uh, and uh, Peyton is uh, now, if I'm right, fairly recently, Communications and Marketing Manager for the University of Exeter, Cornwall Campus. Um, in the spare time, she's a freelance science writer, an editor and writer for Current Conservation, and host of Wildside. Uh, science themed radio show broadcast by Cornwall's The Source. Okay, so um, I'll hand over to Hey. Right. Thanks everyone. Um, thanks for having me back for the second time at Ancestors Trail. I hope I can deliver on the expectations. <laughs> so, as Chris mentioned earlier, uh, I'm going to be talking a little bit about sex today, but I'm not going to be quite so blunt as that. I'm going to address it completely. Um, thinking about how birds, because I'm particularly interested in birds, but lots of the things that I'll talk about will apply to other animals as well, how they use acoustic signaling to kind of get them in the position to pass on their genes. And all of that feels kind of an appropriate thing to talk about at Ancestors Trail because we are interested in evolution, and of course evolution involves um, a little bit of sex here and there, and so I thought it would be kind of a nice way to pay homage to that topic. So, just to give you a brief outline of what I want to talk about today, um, rather than jump right into birds and bird song and things like that, I'm going to have a bit of a background about what communication is in general, so that you can take away more than just the avian aspects of, of the discussion. So, think about what communication is and why animals do it and how they choose the signals that they use when they're communicating. Then I'll jump into the bird stuff and think about what are the sounds that, uh, that birds use when they are thinking about reproducing and how does that allow them to get in the state of reproduction. Um, and then afterwards as well, because they don't just use song and other sounds when they are in the breeding season, they use it year round. So just to start off with kind of a, a broad overview of what communication is. So all these are pictures showing various sorts of animals doing some sort of communication. And I think that all of you would probably recognize these things as communication if you saw them out in the wild. But maybe if I asked you what is communication, you might have a hard time actually giving me a definition. So I wanted to start off with that really fundamental step. So communication is just the transfer of information from one individual to another, or from one individual to multiple individuals. So I'm communicating right now. But information is another thing that kind of requires a definition because like communication, it has a bit of a colloquial definition. And so it's nice to think about what I'm talking about in the context of science and biology. So information is something that reduces some amount of uncertainty you have about your environment. And it reduces this within the context of an evolved receiver system. And that all sounds a bit complex and funny for you, but basically, if you think about it, you may not know a whole lot about um, avian acoustics. Maybe you do, but let's pretend for a moment that you don't. So right now, I am reducing your uncertainty about that topic by giving you these data in the form of my words. And, oops, sorry. Um, and the reason I'm able to do that is that I am talking, I'm using an acoustic signal, and you have ears, so you're able to pick up that signal. So we're using this evolved system that works for all of us because we all have that channel available to us, so we're able to actually uh, pass this information from me to all of you. And so that is allowing you to then take that information and go out and function in an improved way, theoretically. Maybe you won't actually care anything at all about what I'm saying, but you know, maybe you'll use it in some way in the future. Now there are lots of different questions, lots of different types of uncertainty that an organism might have. And in the context of reproduction, there's kind of a series of questions about which we want to reduce uncertainty. So things like, is that individual the same species as I am? Because obviously you don't want to worry about trying to breed with something that's not your own species doesn't usually turn out that well. Things like, what sex is that individual? If the individual is the same sex as you, you might not be nearly as interested in it as if uh, you were different sexes for the sake of reproduction, obviously. Um, also, is the individual actually interested in mating with me? So let's say that you are a male who is advertising to try to get a female and you find a female. You then have to go to the next step of figuring out whether that female 
actually cares about you or whether she's interested in the guy next door. And also, perhaps most importantly um, for the topic that I want to discuss today, is that individual a high quality individual? So let's say we've passed all of these steps. What we really want to know is, okay, once we get to that point of having a potential mate out there in the environment, is that potential mate worth wasting all of your time and energy on? And this is something that's interesting not just to members of your same sex, but also members of the opposite sex, because the same sorts of things that say that you're high quality and a potential partner to um, the opposite sex tend to be the same sorts of things also that are used by a member of the same sex to know that they need to back off because you are stronger and better and are going to help compete them. And so this is actually kind of nice for both males and females. And these are, there are lots of different traits that are worth advertising to indicate that you are high quality. <coughs> this is just kind of a list to get you going, a few examples, but actually there are many. So are you familiar with the local area? Sometimes it's just easier in life if you know where to find resources, you know the lay of the land, that sort of thing. Do you have good morphology? Are you strong? Are you bright? Are you whatever is attractive and useful? Do you have good genes that can be passed on to offspring? Do you have compatible genes that will go well with uh, your potential mate's genes within their genome? Are you intelligent? Are you able to compete with rivals and competitors in the environment? Or even potential parasites, can you somehow get rid of them? Do you have good parenting skills that would make you a worthwhile partner, not just when you're actually having sex, but afterwards as well? Do you have a strong immune system? And again, that's good not just for you, but also for your offspring. Are you the right age? Are you too young to know what you're doing? Are you so old that you're a bit decrepit? Are you right there in a sweet spot? <laughs> so this is just a list of things that actually all sorts of signals can begin to communicate about you that other individuals might find relevant and useful. And again, I should emphasize, because it will come up later, that we're talking about that kind of relevant and usefulness to um, members of the same sex and also the opposite sex. We particularly see that in birth <coughs> and right, singing. Now, communication, of course, can take all sorts of different forms, as I showed with that first slide where I had all the different there are a couple different categories, and I'm only going to really um, focus on one of those today. So you've got inadvertent communication, which we also refer to as cues. And these are the things that are kind of merely a byproduct of other activities. So I'm doing a bit of inadvertent <coughs> communication as I move around on this board that keeps speaking. So I'm not actually trying to signal anything, but it's making that noise anyway. So that's just kind of a cue that you guys in the back or someone outside might use to know where in this room I'm standing. I don't mean to broadcast that information, but I keep doing it. The other thing is deliberate communication. So here I am deliberately giving this talk to you, and that's a signal. So this is um, me using these traits that I have, in this case my voice, to modify another animal's <coughs> behavior. In this case, I'm you know, giving you guys information so that you can go out and employ it somehow. In the real world, with animals out there, for example, we've got something like a wolf, that howls so that its packmates will know where it is and they can coordinate and um, move where they are to come to it or signal where they are so it can go to them. So it allows them to kind of close this circle of signaler to receiver back to the signaler again. Now signals are the things that I'm really going to be focusing on today because of the, those are the active, kind of more interesting things that we tend to see being used within a reproductive now, of course, they also come in different forms. We have things like chemical signals, and we saw lots of this yesterday. Um, with scents and taste, you see that a lot with dogs, for example, with insects will do this as well. Uh, visual signals, again, obviously birds do tend to do this a lot. We've got uh, a, a display that you'll do when you're sitting in place. So, for example, just being brightly colored and beautiful. Then you also might have a moving display where things dance around and kind of pop down, they do little push-ups, all sorts of things. And then you've got auditory display. So for example, all of the birds that we were hearing along our walk yesterday, I can hear them outside right now, so you've got these acoustic signals. Now lots of species will have multimodal signals where they're combining one or more of these things. So for example, you've got these um, baboons that have both a chemical signal, so they have a smell that indicates that the females are in estrus, but also they have these really red rumps. Uh, that kind of brighten up and become enlarged during the breeding season to show that they are ready to mate. So you can have multiple things going on to reinforce that same signal. 
And multimodal signals we tend to find in, in lots of the animals, but particularly important for birds, you'll have them combining lots of things. So we know lots of species that do both visual and auditory things. They kind of say the same thing. And that uh, is the sort of stuff that I'll be talking a little bit more about in a minute. So what determines which of these things you choose to do, whether you want a chemical signal or an auditory signal or a mixture of multiple things? Well, let's think about how communication works out in the world. So you start off with a signaler. In this case, this is a male. This is a chestnut-sided warbler from the US. And he will produce his signal. So this could be any signal, but just for the sake of um, giving you a specific example, I'm showing the notes here to indicate his song. That song will go out into the environment and go through the habitat, where it will finally, at some point at the end of that, either be degraded or be in the same form. It might even be augmented and be received by um, the receiver, which in this case is the female of that species. She will then have some sort of a re reaction, and it will put the ball back in his court. And you see the same general pattern of signaler, signal, environment, whatever is left of the signal, and then receiver, regardless of what type of signal we're talking about. This could be uh, a visual thing, this could be a chemical signal, it could be anything. So the main, there are three main places where you can have uh, something that shapes, really, what that signal is going to be. So, here at least three critical points. So the first of these is the signaler's abilities to begin with. Does that signaler have genetic constraints or physical constraints that <coughs> prevent it from doing a certain thing or that allow it to do a certain thing particularly <coughs> well? If so, that is going to shape which signal it performs and what that signal looks like. Also, cognitive abilities are quite important. You can have all of the physical structure you need to produce a signal, but if you haven't uh, had the chance to learn how to do that from some sort of a, a demonstrator or to have the right neural circuitry for whatever reason, you're not going to be able to do it. So this is a combination of physical stuff and mental stuff. The environment is important because it shapes what is capable of transmitting well through your habitat. And often it's quite difficult to um, maximize a signal, but you can optimize a signal, by which I mean you might produce something that is always going to be degraded as it goes through the habitat because you're, um, you're not sitting side by side with your receiver without any constraints around you. There's always going to be some sort of distance. There's going to be a problem that has to do with physical materials bouncing off the signal, um, so in the case of acoustics. Climate and weather, so you've got temperatures and humidity that can affect how well a signal transmit. Uh, lighting would also have an effect for a visual signal. And things like ambient noise, whether that's acoustic noise or just any other thing that gets in the way of the transmission of your signal. So noise is a scientific concept that doesn't just mean sound, it means any other thing that gets in the way of what you're trying to indicate. So all of these things can affect how well your signal gets to your receiver and can shape what signal you use. And then audience is quite important as well. Uh, you can present lots of information that something doesn't need, so it will just ignore it. So that might then kind of shape your decision as to what you're actually going to, to present. So if that thing that you're trying to communicate with doesn't care about half of your signal, you might just stop delivering that half of the signal. It also might be the case that they simply can't receive it. So here I am delivering an acoustic signal, but maybe for all I know, you guys have no ears and you can't hear. It would be completely pointless for me to keep talking up here. And that happens in the natural world, where you're never going to see something delivering a signal to something really important that isn't capable of receiving it. It, it would just stop delivering that signal over time if that were the case. So you are shaped by what your receiver is able to actually receive. So if you find out that this acoustic signal isn't working, but a visual signal will be great, then we're going to start seeing lots more visual signals. Luckily, I don't have to devolve into interpretive dance. You guys can in fact hear. <laughs> so I think that kind of sets the stage for thinking about uh, bird acoustics and reproduction. So one last definition before I plunge into this, and that is, what is sound? And I know that sounds kind of silly. I already alluded to the fact that, you know, scientifically this means something slightly different um, when we're thinking about noise. So let's think about specifically what sound is and how sound kind of is, is different from what we might call noise colloquially. So sounds are vibrations of molecules. Uh, for us, we're talking 
talking about air molecules, but there are things that produce sound in water and in the ground. And so in that case, you've got water molecules and solid molecules. And those things are all vibrating. And we detect these things with our ears. Birds do as well. Their ears look very, very much stranger than ours do, but there they are. Uh, other species, such as elephants, uh, they can detect sounds with basically ears, if you like, in their feet. They can feel the vibrations through the ground and little uh, fat pads in their feet. Things like uh, some of the different species of insect have effectively ears in their legs where they pick up vibrations through the air. Species in the water can have um, bladders and things that vibrate as the signals come in and so they pick up the vibrations that way. So there are all sorts of structures that allow us to detect the vibrations that we know of as sound. And sounds have three main traits that are interesting and measurable. One of them is frequency, also known as pitch. So that's how high or low something is. Then you've got amplitude, which is volume. Um, and we'll probably have a bit of trouble with that in a moment when I try to play you some bird sounds. But that's whether something is quite loud or quite quiet. And then you've got timing. And timing is quite interesting for birds because they are much better able to perceive timing than we are. And so there's a lot of discrimination that goes on in a temporal, um, in a temporal scale that we don't even notice, but they find very important for discerning whether something is a good signal or a bad signal. So that's things like if something being repeated multiple times, uh, how far apart are things like individual notes and phrases, and what's the overall length of a performance whether that's the note performance, the song performance, the song bout, whatever scale you want to measure it on, how long does that signal go on? And all of those three main things, frequency, amplitude, and timing, those are all kind of the things that come together to make a sound sexy. Sexy to a potential mate or potentially scary to a potential rival. Um, and, and most birds and species, they have kind of specific what? Uh, groupings of those three different characteristics. So you can really tell what species you're listening to, what individual you're listening to, whether it's a quality individual or a low quality individual. Uh, you know, those three things come together in a very specific and predictable way to indicate what animal we are talking about. And that allows you to kind of use those things as a proxy for other characteristics of that individual, of that species, whatever the case may be. So, one of the reasons the sound can be sexy is that it might be quite difficult to perform. So it might be very difficult, difficult to have lots of notes that you sing together in a row for a very long period of time. Because you get tired, your muscles are tired, it's hard to open and close your bill that often, so it takes a lot for you to do that performance. So the harder it is to perform, the sexier it's going to be, or the more intimidating it's going to be, because you know that that is an individual that's really skilled. Intricacy is also important not to do the kind of muscular thing, but thinking about remembering it, learning it, and remembering it. So it takes a lot to hear all of those notes from something out in your environment that you're learning from when you're quite young, memorizing all those things, practicing those things so that you know that you know how to do it, and then delivering them again from one breeding season to the next. So it does indicate a lot of mental capacity to be able to do that. Also, song says something or any sound, sorry, says something about your history. When you are young as a bird, you do have to learn. This is called a crystallization period. You only have a certain length of crystallization in most species. Uh, some species can keep learning throughout their lives, but others kind of have a set period. After that, they know what they know, and that's about it. And during that period, they have to have good nutrition. They have to be well taken care of, because all of that energy from their food and from their overall health, that goes into building up all the brain cells that are needed to learn and to perform. And so if they have a poor history quite early on, then they are not going to be able to produce very good quality sound later on in their lives. So you as um, the listener out there can listen to these birds and say, that was one that clearly developed well, probably in good shape now. Or that was one that had a rough childhood, maybe not going to be in the best condition, I don't want to make it. So these are some of the main things that make it sound like. So again, not an exhaustive list, but kind of the, the crux of what you're looking for as a listener. And basically what they're saying is that same question I, I referred to at the beginning, which is whether an individual is high quality or not. Because you really don't want to have to waste your time on a low quality individual. So that said, let's dip our toes into some of the different sounds that these animals make. 
Singing, of course, is the one that I think we're probably most familiar with. Uh, let me get my mouse to work. I could play you a sound. How do I get my mouse to work? Um, let's see if I can do it this way, sorry. Oh my gosh, and my computer wants to update. <laughs> You're not the first one to have technical issues this All weekend. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it happens. Oh, it decides what it wants to do. Um, okay, here we go. Let's see if I can play it in here. Oh no, my lovely sounds. I can't play them here. Well, I'm not going to demonstrate them myself. I'm very sorry. Um, you said that sounds tend to be, songs tend to be complex, but that's quite a big statement, isn't it? It is. Songs are complex relative to things like calls, which I'll get to in a little bit. Um, so they tend to be complex relative to the other sounds that that animal would make. So we're thinking within a species, um, often. And one of the things that distinguishes them is that they're complex enough that you can't know them innately. So very few species are able to sing a song um, innately. They have to hear something when they're young and learn it, and then they're able to reproduce it. So we would describe these things as being kind of melodious, harmonic, music-like, and that is what, um, it tends to be kind of a, an argued thing based on taxonomy, whether something sings or doesn't sing, but more or less this is kind of a rough way that we divide songs from other sorts of vocalizations. This is a visualization of a song. Here's a call. It might be kind of hard for you guys to see because it's so light right here, but you can see one note very simple as opposed to these notes here, which there are many of them, they're quite complex. So that's a nice visualization of the difference between a uh, complicated, interesting sounding song and just a simple call. What bird is that? What, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. This is a veery. Um, so I chose this one because it's a lovely sound because it has two voices. You can see the top voice here, the bottom voice here. So it has a left and right voice that it joins together in the song. And that's something that birds can do, but humans, with the exception of a few Buddhists and Toriemos, um, we can't really do that. So. <laughs> so this is an example of a bird song, which again, we tend to see in the breeding season being used by males to attract females and by males to repel other males that want to infringe on their territory. Mimicry is a type of singing, but it's quite interesting because it involves uh, quite a lot of memory, quite a lot of learning. So these guys, these are northern mockingbirds, they have a crystallization period that effectively extends their whole lives. They never stop learning. And they are reproducing the noises that are made by other things in their environment. Not just animals, not just birds, but uh, objects, processes, things that humans make. It's really a shame I can't play these for you because I have an example of this guy singing all of these species and then a bunch of others as well. It just goes from one to the other. But then also the second sound was the sound of a, a blackbird from this country, not from North America. These are all North American species. Uh, a blackbird that has learned to reproduce the sound of a cell phone signal. And it has incorporated that into its song and then added its own little flourish on it to make it its own. So these things can pick up basically whatever they hear. So even modern technology, obviously something they didn't evolve uh, to, you know, to focus in on human cues, and yet they have heard those things, picked them up, and they now use them in their own reproductive activities. And then it's kind of funny because there are different ways to do it. You might sing a bunch of different things and then uh, repeat that whole phrase, or you might have a thing and sing it lots and then move on to the very next thing and sing it lots. So there are different ways to put together all of those sounds that you've picked up from your environment. Flight vocalizations are another kind of subtype of singing. Uh, and these are produced by animals that are in the air and they want to broadcast their signal over a, a big space. Now there are different reasons you might do flight vocalizations. So these guys here, goldfinches, they travel in big groups and so they might just want to coordinate with their flock mates as they're flying from A to B. But there are lots of other species that do them within a breeding context because they're trying to really make themselves highly visible and attractive. So snipe, for example, woodcocks, uh, and also rock pivots, they will pop up in the air and do these big elaborate flights 
around in the air while they're making these vocalizations. And it's really hard to miss because there they are vocalizing and tumbling around and it, it, it draws your attention to them so that you will see the physical display that they're doing. But also the fact that they're able to vocalize while doing all the acrobatics is quite impressive because that involves quite a lot of coordination and energy. These guys live in, uh, this is a western sandpiper, they live in really open habitats. So it's quite hard to see them in all that big space. There's lots of other stuff, you know, grass, other birds. And so one of the reasons they pop up and do flight vocalizations, they don't really do much of a flight along with it. It's just that, hey, here I am. You know, they're trying to make sure that you can see them in all that vast amount of space. Nocturnal vocalizations. With some species, obviously, because they're awake at night, that's when they're going to vocalize. That's when they're awake to do it, that's when you're awake to hear it as a potential receiver. But there are other ones that do this because it's particularly favorable for actually transmitting the signal. <laughs> Why do you hate me? Um, can you? I think this is going to restart itself. I'm so sorry about that. what I'm saying about flight vocalizations, and I hope that will finish rebooting. Um, <laughs> I do also have one of flash drive, if I should just use the other computer on my own. Nocturnal vocalizations, sorry. So things like uh, owls and night jars, for example, of course they're going to be singing at night. But things like robins, um, the mockingbirds that I mentioned from before, they often will utilize the, the nighttime because it has really good conditions for broadcasting their signals. The temperatures and the humidities are quite nice for getting a signal to transmit well through the habitat because it's particularly optimized for uh, that molecular movement to get to the receiver. But then also there's much less noise. So there aren't a lot of other species awake at that time making as much noise as you hear at the dawn chorus or at the dusk chorus. So they're able to utilize that open channel, as uh, bioacousticians would call it, so they can get their signal out there and, uh, and reach their receiver. And I have a really nice recording of a mockingbird that was singing, and it's amazing how, relative to that first one I had, there is absolutely nothing else out there. And actually it's kind of echoey, which makes it sound even more impressive because there is so little to compete with it and you can really hear its signal above all the others. Okay, we, what we could do... Just switch over, because that's if you've got that yeah. going through the whole bunch of... If we so might be able to hear it on the other one as well. If, if we yeah. pause, okay, then we could, we could have coffee early and then yeah, let you... No and let you fiddle, it, fiddle with the other team and come back and give you another cup of right. afterwards. Would that be better? Yeah. 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 Okay, ladies and gentlemen. We are starting again. And I'm going to hand back to Peyton Clyde for the second instalment. Um, they tend to know the difference. 
uh, they can tell that it's slightly off. And sometimes you too, as a human, can tell. That it, I mean, you can tell what it's mimicking, but it's not quite right. But there are others that are really convincing. And you only know because of the way it's being repeated. So I'm not sure if this is the right one. Uh, I think it, it just hears sounds. Mm -hmm. It doesn't. So mean it to yes. What's important is that it's picking up a wide variety of them, and including things that are kind of difficult physically to perform. And so it just creates a sound that indicates that it has got the good intelligence and the right musculature to reproduce a certain type of intricacy. So that's what they are hearing. Well, each note, how do you know it doesn't convey information? How do you know it's not saying it's a lot? Uh, well, there have been some studies on that, actually, to try to figure out what the receivers are responding to, how they respond and what they respond to. And it has to do, you just kind of see how they're being um, related to by the listeners. And what is suggested is that they're getting information about the quality of an individual rather than something um, more broad and general like that. So it is doing it to, put, to impress a potential mate or whatever. Basically, I mean, those are the sorts of responses you get. I mean, you could potentially think of an experiment where you could test, is it indicating that the weather is good outside or not? And kind of, you know, correlate. Is it sunny when it's singing that thing? And it, are the other birds responding accordingly? But basically, uh, there have been studies that have looked into sorts of things like that in various species. And what they do seem to consistently indicate are things about quality rather than the gen uh, generic environment, with the exception of predators. So we do know that certain calls and songs are conveying that is a predator and that so is a monkey versus an eagle so versus... Danger. So it is information. Yes. Yes. Quality but, is still information too though. Yeah. I mean you're just thinking about a very specific type of information. But telling somebody that you're good quality is also conveying information. That's why they're doing it. <coughs> so with each of these they do they tend to break them down into the smallest components. Scientists is what I mean by they, um, and see what is responded to and how it's responded to, and then try to figure out from looking at observational observational data and also experimental data what is the reaction it's getting, and therefore what must that information be. So that's how you can figure it out. Did you develop a software to look for repetitions and responses and then, and then decode yeah. probable meanings? Uh, people are actually trying to do that, so uh, they have software now where they're trying to do that with dolphin sounds. Mm -hmm. So they're actually trying to decode the meaning of the dolphin vocalization. So there is some interest in doing that, and I think we're kind of at a rudimentary stage still, but that could potentially happen. But you would have to always involve the receiver as well as the signaler to actually know what's happening. Um, I think you guys probably know that play vocalization, so I won't do that, but here I will play for you the um, the mockingbird, so you can hear how much quieter it sounds when it's singing at night. <coughs> so you hear the complete, the echo in the background, which actually makes it sound even more impressive because it adds, it augments the sound when it's just its own voice going out to the void. So do woodpeckers have adaptations that allow them to drum without hurting? 
have incredibly uh, thick skulls that are able to withstand all this pressure. They have a lot of musculature that can support all of that each time they bang. And they have a very sturdy, straight bill that's not going to get hurt as they hit it against the very hard wood. Booming is another interesting thing that you hear in the breeding season. I've got here um, a British species that some of you might recognize. So these tend to be quite low-pitched booms. So that's a bittern. Um, yeah, David, is that right? Yeah. This, they often are quite percussive as well. Uh, and these are used because of those two things, the percussiveness and the, the low-pitched nature of these things. They're used in habitats where you either need to get your sound out across the big space. So that's the case um, with these guys here, where they have a big open area where they need to attract in all the females to listen to them. So things like grouse and prairie chickens in the US. Uh, or things like bitterns and uh, these guys, so kind of forest-loving or wetland-loving species that are kind of within the vegetation so they can't be seen very well. If they have these vocalizations that are really sturdy and robust as they spread across the habitat, that means that the listeners are going to be able to find them and trap them back and then go to their little scrape to mate to lay eggs or to find them where they've made their little nest. So they can be quite secretive but also at the same time quite available. Duetting is quite fun because it's not just the male, but also the female. And you tend to see this in species where you've got um, the birds staying together year round. So here's singer one, singer two, singer one, singer two here in a second. And we can hear the difference between those two birds because the two different uh, recorders are at different distances, so the one sounds closer than the other. In the wild, if you were standing kind of equidistant, you might think that these are actually the same bird, just going from one bit of its song to the next bit of its song. And these guys, this, when they sing together, no matter where I stand, uh, when they sing together, they are kind of cementing their bondedness. It's very romantic. They do this together during the breeding season to keep them strong as a couple, and also to keep out potential intruders. And also they do it throughout the year, which means that even when they're not actively breeding at the moment, they're still kind of saying, that's right, I'm still with you, we'll breed together in the future. So it allows them to kind of maintain their relationship over time. And again, you tend to see this in uh, tropical places where they do breed multiple times throughout the year without having this kind of uh, spring, summer versus autumn, winter thing that we have in this area. And it's really interesting to see the females vocalizing just like the males, because it means that they have to learn the same things, which you often don't find in other species. Females have to learn stuff so they recognize the males of their species, but they don't have to learn it so that they can reproduce it themselves. So it's a very different spin on learning and producing song. Now I just really quickly want to run through the second bit, because I know that now I've had my technical issues, I don't have as much time, so I'll kind of rush you through. But I did just want to acknowledge that acoustic signals aren't just important prior to the breeding season. I keep talking about getting a mate, keeping a mate, but actually there are lots of reasons why acoustics help with reproduction in general throughout an animal's life, and also with survival, which helps you get to the next reproductive step. Uh, so here's a, a chart that shows the singing rate of an eastern blooper, which is the species that I studied for my PhD. And these guys look like this, here's a male. <laughs> When he is without a female, before he's found a mate, he is going to sing a whole lot. You can see there's quite a high rate of singing. Uh, and that's obviously because he's trying to get that female to come into his potential territory and nesting spot, so he's going to advertise a lot. It kind of goes down once he gets to the point that he's got his female and they're building their nest together in their little nest box. It's very quiet when they've got chicks and eggs because they don't want to draw too much attention, bring in predators, bring in nest parasites. It starts to go up a little bit after the chicks fledge and after they're kind of entering that transition period when the babies are okay on their own. That, that means they can start to think about the next generation that they might produce. And so it kind of starts gearing up into singing more. And then finally, after those babies are firmly on their own and we're ready for breeding attempts number two, the male will start singing again. Even if he's with the same female, he needs to kind of put in the effort and let her know that she's still worth it and that the other male should still stay away. That is, you know, he's 
still kind of in the mood. So there are lots of reasons why you would see this sort of thing cycling through within a breeding season, but then after breeding as well, there are all sorts of vocalizations. So I mentioned calling earlier, those short, simple things that birds use for a variety of reasons to just kind of do basic maintenance of life. Hey, there's a predator over there. There's a good food source in the woods. Let me show you where it is. All those sorts of things. I'm over here, not over there. You know, that kind of stuff. Just basic contact stuff, informational stuff. So you see it in all sorts of species. Again, these tend to be innate. They, don't, they aren't complex. They don't usually have to be learned. The birds are just born knowing how and when to use this stuff. Begging is off, uh, also quite important. Obviously, when you've got chicks in the breeding season, these guys all have to show you that they're hungry, they need help, they're cold, they want warmth. Females will also sometimes beg if uh, they want food from a male or help from a male while they're incubating. Species like cornbells, where the female is enclosed in a cavity, the males have to bring them food because the females can't get out in order to get food for themselves. And so they'll beg to the male, and the male will bring them that care that they need. Hissing, we hear a lot at this time of year, so things like uh, swans and geese and other waterfowl tend to do this a lot, but so do, you can't really see this photo here, but this is a female blue tit. If you disturb them on the nest, they'll hiss angrily. And hissing is a nice sound that we see across the animal kingdom to indicate anger and fear and to keep others away. And because it is so pervasive, we all tend to kind of understand what a hiss means. And so whatever animal is hissing at you, you generally will stop and back off. So it's quite effective. Practicing I kind of alluded to earlier, uh, we have juveniles who listen to sounds, learn them, practice a little bit to see if they can actually make them, and then deliver them fully when they're kind of ready to do that. We find that not just in juveniles, like these guys, who will have started to learn sounds from their dad, but also uh, in older singers that have maybe gone through the winter, they need to make sure that they sound just as good as they did last year, so they'll sit around and kind of mumble to themselves in the early spring, and then produce their first song. And if you walk through the woods, you can actually hear this in the springtime and late winter them. They often will sing kind of with their bill closed, so it is really quiet. They're just gearing up for the breeding season, making sure they can present the best song possible. These guys, um, brown-headed cowbirds, the males also will kind of sing all the things they've learned, and then if females respond poorly, they'll drop out the songs that didn't get such a good response, and they'll just keep the songs that had a good one. So they can also use this process of practicing to figure out what it is they should be singing and to whom. Now, of course, there are lots of different types of vocalizations I've not gotten around to today. All sorts of odd sounds you find throughout um, the bird group. So a lot of the older species tend to make the weirdest sounds, and I just haven't touched on those because of finite time. But birds do make an amazing array of noises that all encode different sorts of information and allow them to do various things throughout their life histories. And other species also do some of the same things that birds do. So we see other species using acoustic uh, song. For example, mice uh, do this. Drosophila uh, flies will make songs as well to wound females. Other insects um, will do nocturnal vocalizations. Crickets are a good example. Bats do nocturnal vocalizations. Booming we see in uh, toads and some frogs, some really big ones. We see them in fish as well. Begging, of course, in humans. Um, all, all animals beg. So there are lots of these things that aren't just applicable to birds, but also to other species throughout the animal kingdom as well. Now, with all of these things, just to bring it back to the evolutionary kind of tone, there are costs. You are literally putting yourself out on a limb when you perform. And, you know, so you often will find this big perch up on top to produce your song, and that's the moment when a predator says, look at that idiot, he's, you know, he's kind of right on himself that says, eat me. And so, you know, these guys will, will go and pick off these little singers. And so you are really exposing yourself to a lot of potential harm by putting yourself out there. But, as we'll, as we'll come to in a minute, of course, that could potentially be worth it. You also have a lot of metabolic costs, so all of that oxygen that you need, all of that energy that you need to get your musculature ready, to get your brain involved in this process, that can burn through a lot of calories, and that is going to potentially be uh, difficult for you to make up later if you then need to go get a bunch of food to, to fuel that again. And then also the time costs. Whatever you're doing 
whatever you're not doing while you're singing is something that potentially is quite important, whether it's preening or resting or foraging for food or taking care of your flock mates. You could be trading off big time in terms of spending the time singing and not something else. But whenever you do all of these acoustic signals, not just singing, but all the other ones, you're putting yourself in a position to get a mate, to get ready for the breeding season, which means that you're putting yourself in a position to produce young, which means you're putting yourself in a position to push on your DNA to the next generation so that this process can continue all over again. And this right here really is the ultimate benefit, no matter how great those costs. So, uh, you know, obviously it's not so great if you get picked off by a hawk the minute you start producing your signal, but if you do lose out on a little bit of food, if you do lose out on a little bit of energy that you have to make up later, if you still are ultimately able to get to this phase, then it probably was worthwhile because that means that you'll have left your generation, uh, left your genes to the next generation, and you'll have succeeded in you know the great imperative in life. So um, these are all the sorts of things that I think about when I'm out listening to animals, for better or worse. And hopefully you guys now can kind of hear things differently when you're out on your next 12 mile walk through the middle of the city. Uh, so hopefully you can kind of keep your ears open next time you go out and hear the world a little bit differently. Thanks for your patience with all of the uh, difficulties.